Um, my name is Maria Balets, and today I'm going to be talking about one of the biggest gaps that we have in our knowledge about psychedelic science, namely psychedelic cognition, and what my idea for addressing this gap in knowledge is and why I think it's important to do it this way. So by this time, everyone is quite familiar with psychedelic drugs and they are becoming the new mainstream, really. They are being referred in the media as self-help tools, as uh, therapeutic tools, and so on. Everyone is pretty much raving about these compounds. And as a result of this, um, a lot of states and a lot of countries are now starting to relax their regulations to make them either decriminalize or to allow people to use them uh, freely, which is quite problematic because it makes us get the understand, um, have the opinion that we have a very good understanding about how psychedelics affect the brain and what they're actually doing, while in fact, we still have a lot of gaps to fill in. And uh, one of these gaps is cognition. Cognition is pretty much what we are using on a day-to-day -day basis to make sense of the world that we live in and to integrate our experiences and thoughts and um, various sensory experiences that we have in order to make sense of the world that we live in. And um, cognition has a few different domains, which we are, which we are using on a day-to-day -day basis for various activities. And that would be the ability to interact with others and recognize emotions, our ability to use memory, attention, or our reaction time. And instances where we are making use of these cognitive domains are as simple as making a cup of tea and as complex as writing a PhD thesis, for example. And it is important to understand how different situations of diff or different substances are impacting different domains of cognition because this makes the difference between someone who is able to carry out activities by themselves or needs assistance. And in the case of diseases where one domain of cognition is more affected than others, such as, for example, Alzheimer's disease, where memory is drastically affected, these people do need assistance at all times, and they are not able to carry out living activities on their own. So therefore, if we understand how psychedelics are impacting each of these domains, we can understand how safe they are in different dosages and um, how we can best uh, make use of these substances without harming ourselves. And what I want to share here is that despite an increasing number of uh, scientific literature papers reporting results on how psychedelics uh, affect cognition, we still don't have a very clear understanding of how these drugs affect the brain. And this is because the previous publications are riddled with limitations and uh, dif difficulties in the experimental design, which makes it quite complicated for scientists and for the general public, as a matter of fact, to draw any conclusions about what is actually happening with our brains under these states. So I'm going to go through all of the limitations that are majorly affecting our understanding in turn. And uh, the first one that I want to talk about is assessing psychedelic effects at different dosages. So, for example, most of the papers are using a medium dose to assess the effects of a psychedelic. And that is not necessarily what most of the people who are using psychedelics are uh, going to take. And therefore, we are missing out a very important proportion of how these effects are different in different circumstances, because um, a lot of these drugs have effects that are dose dependent, which means that at smaller doses, the effects might be a lot more um, easy to control by the person while at uh, higher dosages, then the person might be completely incapacitated and unable to move. So depending on which dose we choose to look at, the results are going to be very different. And hand in hand with this limitation goes uh, another one, which is that of assessing how uh, people perform on different cognitive tests at different time points during uh, different papers. So that would mean that the majority of the previous research is looking at what happens at the peak time 
during a psychedelic experience while completely neglecting what the effects on cognition are at the start or at the end or maybe somewhere along the line. And this is very important because um, it has been noted from more psychologically oriented research that the experience differs in intensity. So at the start, that's when the intensity is building up, up to the peak point, and then it decreases, reaching a plateau stage later on. And it is fair to infer that due to this intensity uh, changing, different domains of cognition would be affected differently and perhaps would be uh, decreased or increased at one of these different time points. Another limitation which makes uh, drawing conclusions very difficult is uh, the fact that different paradigms have been used for drawing conclusions. And uh, one example in such case would be looking at how people perform on a memory task over 30 minutes, let's say, while a different experiment might look at a different set of people performing on a memory task that's only five minutes this time. And the two papers come out with different conclusions. And then people are saying um, that one or the other is true based on which one they believe more strongly in. But once we start delving deeper into what is actually happening, it becomes very difficult to uh, try to draw conclusions based on very, very different paradigms. So the field is in great need of having standardized tools and standardized measures for these effects. And obviously one of the most um, obvious limitations is the fact that most of these experiments have been confined to laboratory settings. And despite a lot of the previous research showing that set and setting is if anything, the very most important factor in a psychedelic experience. Um, people are still carrying out these experiments that are very context sensitive in laboratory settings. So that would be mostly scanning facilities or uh, cognitive testing facilities, which are very different to the usual settings where people do take psychedelics. And just to give a brief example here that might illustrate what I mean, if we are asking someone to perform a simple mathematical operation, such as two plus two, in the presence of 10 scientists in white coats who write notes about it, they might perform very differently in their sober state in such a setting than they would if they are just calmly chilling in their living room or are hanging out in nature with their friends. And ultimately, another limitation is that of uh, numbers. It's very difficult to recruit a lot of people into psychedelic studies and historically this has been made extremely difficult by concerns about safety um, and these are implemented uh, by ethical regulations or by just not having enough people who are willing to be part of such experiments. Um, but surely what we are needing nowadays is um, research studies that are employing higher numbers of people and that is because we know for a fact that each of the psychedelic experiences has very highly subjective characteristics and therefore we need to have more numbers to draw adequate conclusions. So all this in mind, um, this is why I've created Psychedelics at Cognitron. And uh, it is a tool for online cognitive testing that I hope uh, is going to solve some of the problems that I've mentioned earlier. But just briefly, the Cognitron in general is a website for cognitive testing that has been creating in my, created in my lab under the supervision of Dr. Adam Hampshire. And we have previously used this website in a range of different contexts. Uh, which is why it was picked up by the media and it acquired a lot of interest from the BBC. So with the help of the BBC, where we launched one TV series called Family Brain Games and a Horizons documentary, we were able to popularize it in the UK to the point that we were able to collect almost half a million data sets on different cognitive tests from healthy individuals. And this in turn makes it very easy for us at this stage to use this data from healthy individuals and then use the same tasks to measure what happens with people who have different neurological conditions or psychiatric conditions or are special by nature such as entrepreneurs or bridge players 
and then relate them back to this normative data set. And in this case, I am using this past work and past knowledge to build psychedelics at Cognitron. And I'm hoping to be able to solve the problems that I've mentioned earlier. But just briefly, what exactly is happening on psychedelics at Cognitron? This is the website as you come onto it. And the premise of this website is that anyone who is under the influence of a psychedelic drug, right in the moment when they are under the influence, is able to access this website and take part in the study if they choose to do so, of course. And that employs just donating 20 or 30 minutes of their trip to science. And what they would have to do once they get there is quite easy. They will have to start talking to Cognitron, who is this AI that is pictured here on the right. And then Cognitron is going to ask them a couple of questions about what their age is, what their gender is, what substance they've ingested, at what dose, and how long ago. Obviously, if their substance was tested as well and where they are uh, to gather as much information as possible. But very importantly, all of this is anonymous. Uh, Cognitron doesn't collect any IP addresses or emails or anything like this. So it is completely safe for people who use psychedelics to participate in research. And then after they've answered a couple of questions, that is when they are going to be invited to play a few cognitive tasks that are going to inform us about how different domains of cognition are affected in that particular moment. So we are looking at tasks that measure attention, for example. And here is an example of a task that gives you a target, which is in the small square on the left. And then people have to follow the grid on the right and click on the target that mimics the one that they have been shown. And this is a really fun game to play even so far. Other tasks, uh, such as this one that is a very well-known memory game, which I'm sure that everyone played just for fun before, um, are looking at short-term memory and how well people are able to hold things into their memories and finish these card pairs, for example. Then there is emotion processing tasks that are looking to see whether people are able to identify similar emotions or to see whether people's facial expressions are expressing different emotions, which is obviously a very important skill to have on a day-to-day -day basis. And finally, we have language comprehension tasks, such as this one, where we are presented with a word on the top of the screen, and then various possible definitions of that word. So the person has to pick which definition matches the word. And of course, you would think, hmm, tower is a very easy thing to define, but um, it would be surprising to know that even in the sober state, this task is quite difficult for people. And uh, in the psychedelic state, even more so, it would be interesting to see whether people still retain the same meaning for the same objects of day-to-day -day life. And finally, what are we getting out of Cognitron? Uh, on this spider plot, you can see various domains of cognition and an area that is covered. Here on the left, you see someone who has done almost perfectly in all of the different domains of cognition, all of the tasks. And here on the right, you see someone who hasn't really been doing that well. And with these measures that we have here, we can create similar plots for different substances, for different time points, for different dosages, for different settings that the people have taken them in. And Ultimately, factor into the statistical analysis all of the elements that I mentioned before that have been pretty much um, contributing to riddling the other studies with limitations. So we have the opportunity of addressing a great deal of uh, questions here. And one of the most important questions is, are psychedelics treatment or P? Which, which by this I mean, are psychedelics something that should only be used with caution in laboratory settings, in therapeutic sessions? Or are they something that people should be freely having by themselves and how safe are they? Are they enhancing cognition? Are they diminishing cognition? And if so, in which way, at what dosage, when, how? So 
by using safe technologies, we can answer questions relating to science. We can help design healthcare problems for uh, projects sorry, for people. So we can guide therapies, for example. We can design safety measures and implement harm reduction practices that guide people during these experiences alone and ultimately impact drug policy because if empirical evidence gathered on large uh, from large data sets indicates that these substances are safe therefore there is no doubt that uh, drug policies should adapt to this and thank you this was my idea of how to fill in the gap of uh, psychedelic cognition and uh, yeah, that's it.